This is a Wednesday night, October 24th update on Hurricane Sandy and the threat it poses to interests in the Caribbean, Southwest Atlantic, and East Coast of the United States. Currently, maximum sustained winds are 80 miles per hour. The storm is beginning to gain speed. It's moving toward the north at 14 miles per hour, and hurricane warnings are still in effect across all of Jamaica, eastern Cuba, the central and northwest Bahamas, and now tropical storm watches and warnings are in effect for much of the southeast coast of Florida. The four- and five-day forecast positions from the National Hurricane Center have also been nudged a little bit toward the west as a result of a westward-shifting model consensus. All interests across the U.S. East Coast, especially in the Mid-Atlantic and New England states, are advised to keep close tabs on the progress of Sandy. Hurricane Sandy may, in fact, make an attempt at becoming a Category 2 hurricane before making landfall in southeast Cuba. This is a microwave satellite pass captured within the last couple of hours, and you can easily tell that the inner core of the hurricane is becoming better established, the eye is becoming more prominent, and that eye wall is looking stronger with every given hour. The visible and standard infrared animation also reveals that Sandy has become better organized over the past 6 to 12 hours, and on the enhanced infrared, much like as we saw with the microwave, the eye wall appears to be strengthening as the eye itself starts to become better defined. Southwest vertical wind shear may be the only limiting factor that is preventing more rapid intensification at this time. As you can see, the southwest quadrant of the hurricane is somewhat limited, but the southwest shear is also helping to enhance the poleward outflow, which is therefore helping to ventilate the hurricane, especially across the entire northern semicircle. Furthermore, the more regional water vapor imagery shows the poleward outflow channel continuing to extend well to the north now. It's beginning to move into southeast Florida, and it's also encompassing all of the Bahamas. So this is a favorable setup for more intensification. The storm should temporarily weaken below hurricane status over eastern Cuba, but go on and reattain hurricane intensity once again as it moves out across the Bahamas. And even thereafter, once it starts to acquire more so in the way of hybrid, subtropical characteristics, the central pressure should continue to lower. In fact, several models are showing a central pressure well below 960 millibars, which would make this one of the more powerhouse storms that the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast states have ever seen, if it indeed does continue to follow the forecasted projections. As we zoom out even further, using the Northern Hemisphere sector, we can see several of the synoptic weather pattern features that are going to dictate the path of Sandy over the next five to seven days. In this case, everything starts in the far northern Atlantic. Currently, we have a massive blocking ridge situated immediately to the southeast of Greenland. This ridge is holding up many of the weather systems across the northern hemisphere that would like to usually move from west to east. As long as this massive upper level ridge is centered to the north of Greenland, the weather pattern is going to move much slower than what is normal. As a result, we can see that there is a very strong Central Atlantic low situated just to the southeast of the Atlantic provinces of Canada. With a very strong Central Atlantic low located in this region of the globe, this would also help to support ridging across the east coast of the United States. So as long as both of these features remain in place, this ridge is going to want to have the tendency to hand off the tropical cyclone more so toward the north-northwest, immediately in front of this trough that you see swinging out across from the western United States into the Midwest, and eventually it will work its way into the Ohio Valley. So that is the overall scenario that we are dealing with, and we are going to take a closer look at this scenario as we dive deeper into the latest model guidance. Beginning with the latest initialization with the 12Z run of the ECMWF model, we can see the same players on this map. Starting in the North Atlantic, once again, we can see the mid to upper level ridge situated immediately southeast of Greenland, and just to the south of this ridge, you're going to see some powerful Central Atlantic upper level lows. In fact, the Central Atlantic storm becomes more prominent at 24 and 48 hours. And with this upper level ridge near Greenland, this upper level low is going to remain quasi-stationary. And this is going to hold up the entire pattern out across the United States and southern Canada. So although this trough would like to continue advancing more toward the east, it really can't. And between these two troughs, the natural tendency will be for ridging out across New England. And that's exactly what the model was showing with a more amplified ridge from north to south across the mid-Atlantic and New England states. And as we go into 72 and 96 hours, with the trough failing to be allowed to advance more toward the east, it starts to take on a negative tilt, which simply means the base of the trough is oriented more southeast to northwest. 
and the orientation of the trough can make all the difference and the negative tilt would imply that the alleyway between the trough and the ridge for this tropical cyclone is to move from southeast to northwest directly into the mid-Atlantic or New England states and that is exactly what this model is going with as we work our way into day five or Monday morning it's showing a track just to the south of Long Island very close to the Delmarva Peninsula and this is what we would be dealing with at the surface basically a very large wind field in many areas possibly sustaining hurricane force winds if not sustained then definitely at least hurricane force wind gusts not to mention very heavy rainfall coastal flooding as a result of storm surge and believe it or not some of the more interior regions of the northeast could be experiencing some snow especially in some of the higher elevations but once again this is still a five-day forecast and it's still too early to get into any details the models are still ranging anywhere from the mid-atlantic well northward even into the Atlantic provinces of Canada so a lot can still happen we are still certainly not a guarantee for a catastrophic type storm just yet but this is certainly something for all interests across the Northeast to pay very close attention to it is also definitely worth noting that several members of the GFS ensemble suite have shifted from their initial tracks which were out to sea and now several of them are now much more in line with the persistent ECMWF solution and many of the tracks range from the Delmarva Peninsula northward into Nova Scotia and I would also like to stress that although we're focusing on several of these projections if the storm moves anywhere within this region the effects would be far reaching as the storm would have a much larger wind field by the time it moves this far north so if the storm is anywhere within this area pretty much all of the northeast is going to be impacted in one way or another Last but not least, this is the 18Z run of the operational version of the GFS, and this is pretty much the only remaining model that shows a track well to the east of New England, and as you can see here, beginning at 72 hours, the storm is forecast to be just to the east of the Carolinas. We still have the powerful Central Atlantic low to the southeast of Canada, and somehow, some way, the operational run of the GFS still shows that the Central Atlantic upper level low will be able to capture our tropical cyclone, and it moves the storm out to sea or I should first say that it is very close to Bermuda in this run but this seems very suspect because we still have this massive blocking ridge that we saw on the prior charts and with that ridge being in place it's going to be very hard to get this storm to continue moving northeast in the manner that the GFS is showing as a matter of fact even despite the storm moving east of even Bermuda by 132 hours the ridge is still so strong to the north that the GFS is still showing a turn toward the northwest it just comes later than what we're seeing in the other models and it still ends up in southeast Canada so the bottom line for the US East Coast starting with southeast Florida is that interest there can anticipate at least tropical storm force winds especially as we head on into the afternoon hours Thursday extending into Friday when the storm will be making its closest approach most likely as a hurricane over the northwest Bahamas and interest from especially the Carolinas northward are going to have to pay attention to the details thereafter. There is even the possibility of the Outer Banks of North Carolina being impacted by a tropical storm or even hurricane force winds if Sandy gains more longitude than forecast within the next 48 to 72 hours. And for interest out across the northeast, once again a direct landfall is definitely not a guarantee yet. However, the odds of more direct impacts have increased today compared to yesterday and although we can't say anything with a lot of certainty at this time there's enough reason for you to at least maybe begin your preparations in the event that the storm does take this more northwesterly track and it won't hurt if you prepare and the storm moves out toward the east you'll just be prepared for the next system or just say another nor'easter potentially down the road so just prepare now nothing will be harmed by that and we will continue to update you here at 28storms.com as Sandy continues to evolve as it works its way toward the western Atlantic.